Ashley. Uh, hi, everyone. We're here to chat with Ashley today. Uh, Ashley is a friend of mine who I've met recently, uh, and she kindly agreed to share her story with us. So, Ashley, why don't you get us started and tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, and just, you know, getting, um, giving people a chance to get to know you a little better. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Ashley Wonderall Mungai, but you also just call me Ashley. I was born and raised in Kenya, and I am 24, yeah, <laughs> turning 25 this year. A couple of interesting things about me is I have four older brothers. Um, I went to a boarding school. I can speak three languages, but not languages that most people speak. So I speak English, Kiswahili, and Kikuyu. You've probably never heard of those, but yeah, those are the other two languages I speak. And I'm a qualified lawyer from the UK, and I did my first master's there in political economy as well. And I'm now here in Canada doing my second master's in global governance. So can you say uh, hi, everyone, in your first language? Jumbo. Jumbo. <laughs> uh, you know that this, uh, the Grow Entrepreneurial is uh, my, my project to uh, try to inspire, um, you know, entrepreneurial children and teenagers. Uh, so we are here to talk about uh, that aspect of you and your entrepreneurial side. Um, but first, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what does being entrepreneurial uh, mean to you? I think being entrepreneurial, to, in, my, or in my opinion, is just being yourself, being creative and using whatever you have to make a profit and to benefit um, the people around you. So I don't think there's a one shape fits all box on who an entrepreneur is. And I feel like that's part of it is that at every entrepreneur is different because it's a part of who you are. And it's just using who you are to kind of make a profit, make a business, do something different outside of the box. So that's invent, create, um, or even just be someone like us on social media. But as long as you can use that to express yourself and be you and make some money out of it as well, then I guess that's entrepreneurship. Thank you. Um, so who's the first entrepreneurial person you ever met? Oh, hands down, my parents. Um, both my parents are extremely entrepreneurial I would say more so my mother um, because she did like very unconventional roots and my mother always has side businesses for as long as I can remember she's always had her core business but every time I talk to her it's like oh we started this we started that we started this I'm just like how do you have the time so definitely my mother <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing so you had entrepreneurs in your house. So, you know, you kind of had to become entrepreneurial yourself, right? Um, so do you mind sharing some of the things that you learned from your parents uh, as entrepreneurs? What, what are some of the, you know, things that you would say had the most impact on you growing up? Um, I think for me, the discipline of hard work, it definitely came through from both my parents. I think I was working in either of their businesses, probably from the age of 10 or 12. Um, respectively. And the one thing that they always instilled in me is that, you know, you got to get up and you got to work. Nothing's going to be handed to you. And I think for me, coming from a slightly privileged background in my family being entrepreneurial, like it was expected that I'll kind of be lazy. I could inherit and everything. But I think they always consistently told me, you know what, whatever you get in this life, you've got to work for it. If you want to have something good in this life, then you need to work ex extra hard for it. Nothing comes easy. And I think they also taught me to be creative. It's I hope one day I get to meet your parents, especially your mom. She sounds like a super cool lady. Okay, awesome. Um, so you yourself uh, have your own uh, venture, which is actually a social venture. You told me a little bit about it before. So could you maybe talk a little bit about um, what your social venture is about? Uh, you know, what's your mission? Uh, what problem are you solving? Um, and, and that kind of stuff. So it is a social venture solely because it initially started out as a charity. And along the way, we realized that we needed to make it sustainable and to be able to survive beyond getting donations from people. And that's how it slowly turned into being a social enterprise. But I think it'd be easier if I tell you what the charity is about. So the charity um, is called Hands and Feet. 
And what it does is that it does activism against early marriages and FGM as well. So through that, we have put in libraries, have put in a borehole, and also built a counseling center and safe house for girls affected by FGM and early marriages in northern Kenya in a place called Samburu. And our mission is working with the community for the community. And we actually started this when we were 15, so which is why it's changed what we do every year because at 15, we were kind of like learning on the spot, figuring things out along the way. And the social enterprise came when now we all went to university. So we all went to university outside of Kenya, all over the place, but we wanted this to carry on without us just doing big sales to raise money. So when I was in the UK, I decided to start selling African jewelry made by the women in the community and also women from my community to be sustainable. So every um, profit that I got that from any of the sales, I reinvested it into the charity, used it to also be part to sustain the feeding program because we also now run a feeding program that feeds over 70 children every single day in the morning and in the evening. So basically one necklace would give the kids another week of food. And that's kind of how I started um, maintaining this over and over. And then slowly the social enterprise grew into its own entity because I wanted something that I could use as my own platform to do activism as well. And to also continue being expressing this creative side of me. That is absolutely incredible. So you started another venture to support your, your charity, which um, is pretty smart and pretty entrepreneurial, if you ask me. Um, okay, so let's talk a, a little bit about the, the charity first. So what, how, how did you first become aware of the, this problem? If I'm honest, we kind of stumbled upon it by accident, if I'm very honest. It wasn't planned. It wasn't intentional. So we were doing um, this thing called President's Award or the Duke of Edinburgh, which is kind of you do, you do hiking trips and you have to have an element of service in it as well and then along the way as you, as you accumulate your service hours you also go on longer and longer hiking trips mm -hmm. so we had gotten to the place where we're about to get our gold certificate and we were so excited so we thought why don't we combine our hiking trip with our service trip mm -hmm. so we met with these missionaries who told us oh we have a project up north in kenya and we were like yes road trip get away from our parents for two weeks yes we're doing this so when we got up into the community is when we started realizing there's a lot more um, problems and issues than we realized. So we initially went to do a sanitation campaign and to put in the help put in a borehole. But after we put in the borehole, one of the things that um, happened was that the community invited us to a wedding to say thank you. So we were like, yes, excited. We get to go to a wedding. <laughs> Woo -hoo! Like, we're like, this is the best road trip ever. I'm away from my parents. Now I get to go to a wedding. And some world weddings are famous for being colorful and beautiful. And everybody dresses up in all these like traditional regalia, meaning the guys have like feathers in their hair. The girls wear all this fantastic beading. And like, I'm a city girl through and through. So this is exciting to me. So I was like, yes. <laughs> so when we now got to the wedding, it's now at the wedding where we realized that we asked, okay, where's the groom, where's the bride? So we were shown who the groom was. And this is like some beautiful, handsome, like, I mean, tall, dark and handsome, the whole thing, um, Moran, which is a traditional warrior. And then we were shown who the bride is and she was not older than seven or eight. And our hearts broke, I promise you, we wanted to cry, we wanted to fight everything. That's when we realized that we couldn't stop that wedding but from then on we said we wanted to be part of the solution and that's now where hands and feet was born so by finding out talking to the community we asked them how can we help and that's when they started telling us we need a safe place that's where we started fundraising for the safe house and counseling center and started doing empowerment workshops as well can you can you uh, maybe just Explain a little bit uh, how, the kind of work you do in in the community. Uh, what are the, what are the things that your organization offers? So one of the big things that we do is empowerment workshops. So we go into the local high schools and we talk to the girls and we tell them that you know what, yes, this is there's a difference between culture and who you are, and there's also this sense of you can be anything you want to be. 
And this is something that was such a novel idea, especially in this community, because for many of them, the track, the track was you go to school, you get married, you have a baby by 16. So us going into the community and telling them, actually, no, I'm 16, I'm 17, and I want to go to university, and I want to speak up, and I want to have my own voice. That was something that they'd never heard, even though it was the 21st century. So we started working with the community to do these empowerment workshops, but we also started seeing that what resources do these girls need to be empowered? So that's now when we put in the library, which is the very first library that was even equipped with computers in the area. So we did that. Then we listened to them and asked them, what else do you need? So we helped them put in a, a, a lab. I think the big thing with whatever we do, we always ask the community, how can we help you? What do you need? So we don't believe in doing this. Sometimes a new thing of like, we know exactly what you need. We will tell you what you need. We don't believe in that. So everything we do, which is under our mission statement, is working with the community for the community. So out of that is when they told us that they need a safe place and then we built the center. So our projects are very much, we listen, we hear, and then we try and support what they do. Yeah. Wow. That is wonderful. So what are the biggest challenges that you you have with this project? I think the biggest challenge was one, the fact that we were so young, is that in the beginning, a lot of people, including our own parents, thought it was so dangerous. Like, what are you doing? Because like, I would lie to you, where we work in, in, and do this project was 14 hours drive from where we all live in the basically the middle of nowhere. So trying to convince our very conservative, protective parents that, yes, we will let our children drive off to the middle of nowhere and do who knows what was a huge challenge, getting them on board. But a second thing was also getting the community to accept the fact that we're not challenging their culture, we're not condemning their culture either. What we want to do is support their daughters instead. So our way into that was saying that we want to do the feeding program. So the feeding program came as a byproduct of wanting to be accepted by the community and also um, even when we built the center, we didn't bring builders from other communities to do anything. We built the entire center all through volunteer work. Um, so we stayed there for three weeks. We got everyone, the youth, the women, the children, everything. And we built everything using sustainable products around us, whatever we could find and through volunteering. So even as much as they didn't necessarily agree with everything that we were saying, they took ownership of the project as well because it was not ours, it was all of ours. And I think that's what helped us to overcome our greatest challenge of the fact that this is a very contentious issue, culturally, especially. I can understand your parents as a parent. I probably have the same um, questions and concerns, uh, but I'm sure they were also proud of you because this is amazing work. I mean, at 15, if that's what you're trying to do and that's your goal, I think it's pretty admirable. Any parent would be proud. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm super impressed. Actually, I told you this before, but yeah, it's, it's incredible. Um, okay. So we talked about, uh, challenges, uh, but what about your biggest supporters? Who would you say were your, you know, support p pillars, uh, along the way, uh, both, you know, uh, from sort of, uh, supporting you to go, to continue with this project, but also, you know, in the community, uh, to be able to, to get things done, right? D despite the challenges that you were referring to earlier. I would say um, in terms of in the community, we partnered with the missionary group that did introduce us to the project and the local activists, because again, we are young, we're novices, so we did want to pretend that we know everything. So even as much as we were in school and even now when we're in university and doing everything, they run the project for us. So we did that partnership. I think one of the big things was recognizing our limitations and asking for help where we needed it and we needed their expertise of knowing the community and how to run things. I think on a personal level, our school was amazing. Like initially all our fundraising came from running bake sales, car washes, um, fun days, all of that. So that's where our school was very supportive of allowing us to basically take over their cafeteria and do random things. And then our parents as well. I think just the, the moral support of saying that, like even against all odds that they support what we're doing, even if they don't always understand it, 
they would have preferred we pick something closer to home, um, but they were very supportive. So I think those were definitely the three main groups I will give a huge credit to. And it's great to hear that the school played an important role in supporting you guys and, and you know, seeing this project through with, with you. So who were you working with? So it was you and who else? Five of my best friends, to be honest. And we're still best friends now. I think a huge thing of it was also us, when we graduated, when we turned 18, we all decided we still want to do this. And it's also our way of staying really close because currently like I'm here in Canada, one girl's in America, the other girl's in, in, in still in Kenya, South Africa, we're literally all over the place. But this is one way that we're able to stay best friends because our friendship is not just um, based on banter and fun. It's also based on actually we have a mission and a purpose that we want to see too. Well, thanks for sharing all of that with, uh, with me and everybody that's going to be watching this. Um, two, maybe um, one last question to bring this conversation about your entrepreneurial journey to an end and then go into the next uh, question that I have for you is, what would you say is the most gratifying um, part about your work? I'll give you guys a story. So one of the first times that we went into the community, we were in a classroom and we were just running a campaign, we're just talking. And then as the girls, we kicked the boys out. We were like, okay, you guys go away. We want to talk to the girls. We just want to have real talk. And we did our session, everything. And at the end, two girls came up to me and they were like, how is it that you are a girl and you have boys in your group, but you are loud and you are vocal and you can, you seem like you're one of the leaders. And I'm like, but why not? But you see, for them, they've never seen a girl take leadership. They've never seen a girl be vocal in the presence of men because in their community, women are supposed to be seen and not heard lest you become a commodity. So to be able to show them that was I think one of the most gratifying moments for me. So to even see some of those girls now having graduated, some also pursuing university as well and getting a letter from one of them later saying that, you know what, I have a voice because I saw that you have a voice. And that for me is one of the most gratifying things ever. Yeah, that would be for anybody. That is, uh, that is great. And I'm not surprised that you are inspiring to people because you're just, you're just a ball of energy and positivity. So uh, you are inspiring to me as well. Um, now that we are talking to, you know, young people out there and who maybe are you know thinking about doing something entrepreneurial in in their own lives um maybe let's just talk a little bit about some advice you might have for them for example um you know how do you and, and this is a, a question that comes up often like how do you uh, identify problems and and how do you know their problems worth solving i mean in your case um it's obvious that it is a it is a problem, but you know maybe not so obvious to the community you were in, but to those outside of the community, you know, child marriage is a problem. Uh, but uh, in general, though, um, you know, how how do you go about, in your opinion, uh, identifying problems, and how do you sort of weigh whether it's a problem, you know, worth solving or or not? Any advice you have on that? Um, yeah, I think I'd say something that my mom actually told me, and this has nothing to do necessarily with a charity, but she said just in general, if you see a problem and you can see it, the chances are you are the solution to that problem. Or if you can see a gap, then maybe you should be the one to creatively come up with a way to fill that gap. So I genuinely am of the mindset that sometimes you other people don't see problems and that's not their fault not to see it if you see the problem then the honest of you is to be part of the solution and so long as you think it is worthwhile then who is who is there to tell you that it isn't and i think the best thing is that all you need is i think probably one or two other people to see that it's also a problem for you to know that actually it's not just my imagination there's something worth pursuing here Wow, your mom is a cool woman. Did I tell you I really want to meet this woman? Um, okay, but um, it can be really scary to take action, right? Uh, what advice do you have for young people 
uh, to sort of face those fears um, when they're feeling like, oh, you know, hesitant and not sure whether they should go forward with, um, you know, their solution or working on a specific thing. What do you say to them? I think what I would say is that you are always your worst enemy, if I'm honest. You're always your own worst enemy. You're always your own worst critic. That sometimes you just got to go get out and start and you can figure things along the way. Like, as I told you, we started this project by accident. Even when I started the now the social enterprise selling jewelry, I didn't think it would turn into a business. I initially started as a little stall outside my campus SU cafeteria, kind of just there selling jewelry. And out of that, it became a business. So I would say this start and it is scary. By all means, it is terrifying. But courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is doing what scares you the most and still plowing through. So I would just tell anyone, you know what, try. The worst that can happen is you fail. But most brilliant solutions and innovations come out sometimes of failure. So flourish. Well, you are just spreading the wisdom. So I'm going to leave it at that. I think that was beautifully said. Okay. So now we're just going to go back to talking a little bit more about you and getting to know um, Ashley, the person, a little bit better outside of the, all of the amazing things that you're doing for the world. Um, okay, so you have now officially lived on three different continents, which is pretty amazing. Wow, I wanna hear all about that. But my question more specifically is, uh, how would you say this experience of, you know, language and cultural immo uh, immersion has influenced the person who you are today? Oh, my days. I am genuinely who I am today because of getting to know different people. So I am of the mindset that difference isn't something to be scared of, but difference is what makes the beautiful tapestry that is life. So I feel like traveling has made me understand different cultures. Like right now, I feel like I could be friends with anyone from any background, any cultural orientation, sexual orientation, race, whatever. And I could find a, a common ground with everybody. And I think that has been so helpful because I'm able to A, taste some amazing good food from everywhere. B, get to know the most phenomenal people and learn lessons that I never would have. And getting out of your comfort zone is terrifying, but also fun. Uh, and I'm living proof because look, you were able to make friends with a Romanian Croatian living in Canada. And even though you cheer for England in the game against Croatia, we're still friends. Here we are having a conversation and a good time. Uh, it's true. Ashley is the friendliest person that I probably met in uh, the the longest time, especially during this pandemic. So uh, I am so glad you came into my life. Um, okay, you were very young when you left your house. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Um, and you know, what was the scariest thing about leaving? So I left home technically at the age of 13 to go to boarding school. And then I was in boarding school up until I was 18. And then from boarding school, I more or less went straight into uni, but I left Kenya for uni. So I went to the UK, which left meant leaving the comfort of my country, my family, everybody I kind of knew, going into a whole new culture. I think the scariest thing was leaving home. So even whereas when I was in boarding school, like I knew worst comes to worst, my parents can come pick me up. Like, like it's my, a bit of a drive, but if things go horribly wrong, they can come. Going to university in a different country, worst comes to worst, I can't exactly get on a flight for eight hours. It's not exactly the same dynamic. So I think that was the scariest thing. And also just the unknown. The unknown is scary. It is just getting on a flight, not knowing, am I going to make friends? Am I gonna like my housemate, all of that. Like all those questions do go through your mind, but I'm living proof that it's not that bad and you will find friends, you will find a new community and you'll fall in love with it. And technically I'm an exchange student here in Canada. Like this year of me being here is technically my exchange year on my master's program. 
mm-hmm. and I'm loving it. And I would say that there are things that you never find out about yourself sometimes until you step out of your comfort zone. And the like the knowledge and the self awareness that you get when you step outside of your family, your safety net, you do something different, you get to know different people, you discover a side of you that you may not get to see when you're just at home in your four walls. So I would say if you have that opportunity, take it because you never know who you become, the lessons you'll get. And just as an FYI, me leaving countries also helped me change careers, knowingly and unknowingly. So you never know. Great advice. Listen to Ashley, everybody out there. Um, and I'm just amazed that you are loving your exchange to Canada, even though you've been locked up pretty much since you've been here because of COVID and the lockdown we were in. And you're just getting to see the sun and feel the warm weather now. So um, kudos to you for keeping it positive and enjoying Canada regardless. Okay, so now um, going back in time a little bit more to when you yourself were a teenager, we already know that you were starting an incredibly meaningful uh, charity at 15, but let's talk about uh, school a little bit. So what would you say was your most favorite thing about school when you were in high school? Favorite thing was sports. You can't tell that now because like I eat cake so much, but I was really sporty in high school. So I loved playing sports. I was on every other sports team. And I think the incentive for that was, I mentioned I was in a boarding school. So by playing sports was the only way you could actually legally get out of school. So that was a huge incentive to do. So definitely sports and theater. I was a theater buff, acting, drama, the whole shebang. Could probably tell by how I move my hands all the time. So yes. I love it. Um, What about your least favorite thing about school? Easy, math and chem. I still... Honestly, this is going to be, all the teachers will hate me for saying this, but I have never used Sokotoa in my life. Nobody has ever asked me about the period of periodic table in my life. So I still do not love any of that. So math and chem, nah, not for me. I was not blessed with those graces. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, what uh, advice would you give your uh, high school self? I would tell my high school self, stop stressing. I would honestly tell myself, like, stop stressing. Um, It may look like your life is over, but it really is not. It's just beginning. Uh, And I would also tell my high school self to enjoy life more. Um, Take it easy. Still work hard because you you need your grades at the end of the day, but the stress isn't worth it. Enjoy life more and... Your existential crisis is not an existential crisis. Love the advice. Let's leave it at that. So now let's go back even further in time to when you were younger, a younger child. Um, So you mentioned you grew up with four older brothers, uh, which I think is super interesting. My daughter has two older brothers and I can see some influences on there, but I was wondering, you know, what would you say, how did that experience growing up with four older brothers uh, influence uh, Ashley we see today? First of all, oh my days, they bullied me so much. I love them now and we get on so well now, but they bullied me so much. Um, <laughs> but I think I'm grateful for that because now I have such tough skin. Oh my days. There is nothing you can say to me that my brothers probably did tell me when I was younger. And I think also... Um, also in terms of like my dating life I am so aware of so many things because I saw them go through it with half their girlfriends and everything so I'm grateful to them because I don't fall for as many lies or as silly things as I probably would have because I'm naturally overly trusting so they helped toughen me up see the world in a different light so definitely grateful for that yep it's it's uh it's a great uh lens into the future right having all the siblings okay what did you used to do for fun Ooh, for fun i loved to dance dancing was my thing 
Um, I already mentioned um, sports and I love to sing. I actually used to be in a band. So that was my thing. Music, dancing, the whole shebang. Wow. Okay. Do you still sing? A little bit, actually. I do. A little bit. Well, not here in Canada, but outside of that, I do. And definitely in the shower. I have the best concerts in the shower. So, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Next next time we chat, uh, you will be putting, to, uh, putting on a show for us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, what did uh, child Ashley want to be when she grew up? Ooh, child Ashley wanted to be a diplomat, I think. Yeah. I just wanted to travel the world and be a diplomat as well. Yeah. Okay. And what did your parents want you to be? My parents wanted to be, me to be a lawyer. They were very certain I was going to be the family lawyer. Yes. <laughs> I can see that. I can see that. Um, okay. And uh, lastly, what do you think that child Ashley would think about current Ashley? I think child Ashley would be very surprised because I would say I'm definitely not doing what I thought I would do. Neither am I doing what my parents thought I would do because, yeah, convincing my parents I'm not going to practice law was eventful. But I think I think she'd be proud because I'm now doing, apart from like the charity as well, I'm working in policy, I'm doing my second master's, I hope. I hope that she'd be proud. And I also think, even if it's not what my parents wanted me to do, I hope and think that they are actually proud of me. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure they are. It's hard not to be, Ashley. You're amazing. Okay. And do you have any parting words for the curious, you know, children or young people, teenagers that are watching this video and are hoping to become, you know, inspired um, in an entrepreneurial way? Um, yeah, I think if I was to think off the top of my head, I think I would say that we live in a world that will consistently tell you everything that you cannot do. Or we live in a world that makes you think that, okay, I just need to do this and then I'll be rich in 10 minutes, which also is not true. But what I would say is that you have exactly what it takes to be successful. You have exactly what it takes to be the entrepreneur you've dreamt to be, to accomplish all those dreams. And I think that one thing that you're so insecure about might be the thing that makes you relatable to somebody else. Your insecurities are not always the worst thing about you. They're what make you human, relatable. So use it to be the best entrepreneur you could ever be, to be the best engineer, doctor, whatever your dream is. Use your hands, feet, insecurities, all of you to be your very best. And that's my two cents. Love it. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And oh my gosh, Camila, you know I love you. And honestly, you students are the luckiest people to have her. Oh, oh. my goodness, she's brilliant. <laughs> All right, now we're getting cheesy. You know, I love you, but all right, nice talking to you. Bye.